Hi guys, it's Adam and welcome to another video. So today we are going to do a video in the Young series and we are going to be looking at the anima and the animus. So I am going to come from a little bit of a modern perspective on this and try and relate them to equality as well because I think it's important that I stress the equality and the equal nature of both the anima in the woman and the animus in the man and obviously the unconscious opposite um, in the same person. So for example, uh, the man would have a conscious animus or what's sort of uh, referred to as the masculine side of the personality um, and then an unconscious anima and then the woman would have a conscious anima or the sort of feminine side of the personality and then an unconscious animus. And so we've got a few different things that we need to talk through with this. It's actually quite a, a broad subject and you can actually get really, really deep into uh, this Jungian concept specifically because it has a very, very strong influence within the process of individuation. And as I've touched upon before, the process of individuation in terms of looking at the anima anima specifically is about getting a, a holistic balance in your conscious awareness and also in the back of your unconscious um, in which you're, you're actually balancing the masculine and feminine sides of your personality and you can be more of a holistic person. Now obviously that is with regards to expression within your wider and more unique personality. So it may be that you get a, a, a holistic balance between the anima and the animus but actually you're the kind of person who is a, a man and you're quite masculine anyway so you may still present that more masculine side in your personality but there will still be sort of behind that there will be this uh, sort of more balanced um, center really and you will have actually integrated that more I suppose internal uh, strength of the anima and also that uh, sort of sensitive side of the anima as well you will have sort of integrated that even though within your unique expression of personality you may come across still quite uh, masculine and still possibly even in consciousness a little bit of those uh, maybe even the negative sides of the animus or what could be con uh, considered the negative aspects of the animus of being a little bit overbearing certainly you will display still the positive aspects of the animus being reasoned and having external strength and I've also heard it talked about with um, actually James Hall who is a Jungian analyst uh, as I think logic as well I think he says in, in one of his books. Um, so yeah I do want to get a good kind of uh, basis for you guys on this so first off we're going to go through the anima animus traits. So you can see here I've drawn a line and basically uh, the top are the more positive traits and the bottom are the shadowy sides of them or the negative traits or what could be considered as the negative traits. So in the woman, um, it's more about internal strength and a real connection with sensitivity, emotionality, and a good idea of what I've, uh, a good sort of um, example I've come across here is when you've got a group of women together or maybe a group of girls in high school, let's say, you always get a, a very loving relationship with those people. For example, if you have girls who are going on a sleepover, they're always very, very um, communicative with each other. And I think communication really, not necessarily within the animal itself, but just with women in general, they seem to have more communication skills than, than guys do, or they seem to be um, friendlier with their communication. As I say, less overbearing, obviously, the animus is the, the side that's a little bit more overbearing or opinionated. Um, but if you've got this example, you've got these uh, girls who are really uh, understanding of one another's emotion and very kind to one another and very nurturing of one another. And that's a very, very that's kind of a, a real uh, positive element of the feminine, the, the, the anima essentially there. Um, now, uh, the negative traits can be oversensitive, can come out as being moody and stuff. But I want to also reflect this here as well. If a man has over-integration with his anima instead of his, his animus and his conscious awareness, that will come out in the man as oversensitive and moody and things as well. So, for example, there might be a man who has a very, very uh, big feminine side, and I've always thought of myself, really, as having quite a uh, pronounced feminine side, really. And so uh, that man will adopt, obviously, or will have the traits of the anima, and so they 
they may have more internal strength, they may be more, um, uh, kind of have a better connection with their, their emotional side, but also they may have the negative traits of the oversensitive and things like that. In the opposite side, a woman may have adopted more of the traits of the animus and she may adopt more of those traits. So more likely she's going to adopt or she may adopt the negative traits. So being a little bit overbearing or opinionated, um, but obviously she could adopt the positive traits as well as being a bit more reasoned and having more external strength. And I am going to get on to the gradients of this later on because this isn't black or white I mean people um, can have like a sort of a gradient of these so uh, you could have a woman who let's say um, hasn't maybe had a mother when growing up and she's had a father and she's had a very very pronounced father figure she might have a large identification with her animus rather than her anima and she may need to in future it might be a possibility that she needs to do if she has some psychological instability or whatever or just doesn't feel whole um, she might need to work on her anima a little bit more and so obviously you have a woman who grows up and maybe she's I don't know 20 years old 25 years old something like that and you can actually see more of a, a an external strength in that person but it's not only that we can't put it down just to the animus of the anima it could also have an archetypal basis to that as well so it could be uh, more of an ident identification with the four traits of the mature masculine because of obviously seeing her father and so she's adopted an archetypal basis of let's say the king or the hero or something like that opposed to uh, some other archetypal basis maybe like one of the four traits of or even all four of the traits of the uh, mature feminine for example the queen or the I think the wise old woman is one of the mature traits of the feminine as well um, but it isn't it isn't black or white there's all these and it all integrates into our personalities and we are all unique expressions um, and obviously what comes into that unique expression in part is you know sort of our integration with our animus or our anima depending which one obviously or even just the balance between um, the two but it's much more than that you know personality types come into it archetypes come into it um, I mean it, it's so there's such an expanse of stuff that comes into to um sort of expression of personality really it can't just be put down to this specifically um so individuated unconscious interplay so this is i wanted to discuss this because it's interesting so you may have let's say someone who is individuated and maybe they are i don't know 45 years old 50 years old and you may have a man and you may have a woman and they may know each other may, they may be friends in real life and the woman has integrated her animus and and they've got more of a holistic balance and because they're individuated and the man has integrated his anima and he's got more uh, sort of you know that he's integrate he's integrated and individuated so the man has more uh, a little bit of that sensitive side because he's integrated and the woman has a little bit more of that other kind of overbearing or also reasoned and external strength in there as well and so you see or you can do you can actually discern this when you're when you um really start to look into um you know the Jungian concepts i mean it t i think it took me about 12 months of do it or well six to twelve months of doing introspection every single day interpreting my dreams everything doing all the stuff i need to do every single day until i could actually recognize the anima and the animus in people as they are you know in experience um so it takes quite a while to be able to do this and that is one of the steps on the road to uh, sort of conscious integration of your anima or animus if you're going down the route of, road, uh, route of um, psychoanalysis and actually integrating them in, in that way, really. Because you can also integrate them unconsciously. In fact, you can, you in, basically all the things I've talked about in this series, the social persona, the shadow and stuff, I've talked about them in a way of um, people integrating them through psychoanalysis. But that's not the usual way they get, they all get integrated. In fact, how things normally get integrated is through autonomous processes from the psyche. And so the, the psyche just guides them along. And they may have archetypal dreams at certain points in their life. And they may remember them. But we don't necessarily interpret them or anything. But they are little guides and, and, and ways 
to obviously integrate these things. So most people, the vast majority of people on the planet, may never look into psychoanalysis, may never understand the Jungian concepts, but they have obviously all integrated them by the autonomous processes of the psyche and going through what Jung called the different stages of life. So, for example, growing up, going from like childhood to adulthood, um, getting married as well, having children, moving into old age, and then obviously death as well. And for all these kind of, uh, for all these stages of life, there's autonomous processes going on that obviously um, unconscious consciously are trying to integrate these um, these archetypes and these themes these concepts with yourself um, but obviously um, you know I, I kind of see it from a uh, I see it under the curtain or under the rug how it's not meant to be seen because of course I, I practice psychoanalysis and stuff so I, I practice self psychoanalysis so Therefore, I talk about it in that way, essentially, and my, the people who I'm trying to um, talk to here are those who actually want to understand about the concepts and want to understand them within a setting of psychoanalysis and actually self-improvement within the, the back of your unconscious really and actually pulling things out rather than the normal autonomous way things happen. Um, but so you've got those two people there, basically. And they're integrated and have obviously they may have unconsciously integrated their anima after years of development. Um, and so you see this interplay between two people and you can see it just comes out subtly consciously. Those kind of little traits of the anima, some the anima. And you can see this lovely little play in which the woman very much is aware, not necessarily in personality terms of the man she's talking to, but in terms of this um, understanding of what it means in terms of the anima, what the, sorry, animus, in what the, the man means, in what the animus means. And so she can kind of, um, almost, it's almost as if uh, she gives, uh, gives as much as she can get or something really. It's kind of like that in one way, although that would be more of a reductionistic way of talking about it. But when the animus is displaying more overbearingness, because she's integrated that side of her animus as well, she can obviously come back with that. And also the man can, again, this is pretty much all unconsciously, just um, within the uh, communicating with a man and a woman who's individuated. Um, the man can obviously show that more sensitive side when it needs to, needs to occur and stuff. And obviously you can say um, a portion of this or quite a uh, fair, fair portion of this could be put down to as well just simply um, intelligent reasoning and things like that but there is behind that this kind of playing of the animo and the animus and stuff and these traits that, that pop up and pop into um, conversation, pop into um, the words and the, not necessarily just the words but the way in which people are with one another as well. Um, so that's what I wanted to talk about, kind of this, this um, Unco unconscious interplay between those kind of traits of the anima and those traits of the animus, especially when we're talking about individuated people. Although even if we're not talking about individuated individuated people, it, it will happen in those who aren't. But it'll be kind of it, it won't be complete in its making because if a guy hasn't integrated his anima, he won't understand the animo in, in its completeness, in its wholeness, and therefore that interplay won't be as effective. It'll be kind of a little bit, um, it's like a puzzle piece, you know, you're trying to put a, a round puzzle piece into a square hole. It won't it won't quite go. It needs more development. And, and basically in that circumstance, the analogy of a puzzle piece, you'd have to literally cut off part of the piece to be able to make it fit in that hole. Um, and so that could be obviously um, the same as kind of synonymous with the actual development and refinement of uh, the understanding of the opposite of whether that's the anima for you or the animus. And then once you've got that refinement, then the puzzle piece fits and then there's there's a better interplay there essentially um and so this is why also you see um older men or older women when they're talking to younger people and yes there's a lot to do with experience here and also the experience is in direct relation to the anima and the animus but you see older people you know maybe the 50 or whatever they talk to younger people in a lot kinder way they under because they understand the the nature of this they understand the nature of the man the nature of the woman the anima, the animus, etc. Um, 
And so that's interesting to point out as well. And it's obviously because they're individuated and so they're a stronger character overall. And so, uh, you know, they, they have that kind of uh, more uh, sympathy and understanding of that younger person who hasn't developed that individuated state or that real inherent character yet. Um, so that's very, very interesting. So I wanted to talk about the feminine man and the masculine woman, which I kind of already have done. So imagine that the anima and the animus are on a gradiented scale essentially so you've got the anima this side and the animus that side it's like a gradiented color scale or whatever so essentially as i've just touched upon briefly you could have certain circumstances in childhood that then put you more towards the anima or more towards the animus but it's so finite this scale and it's so um it's not clear cut it's not certain or anything there's not it's not black or white so this obviously means that you could have a certain sway towards the animus. But you might be a really, you might be a really kind of um, overbearing, opinionated person who has a lot of external strength or whatever, and then you may have quite an uh, overbearing sort of. Uh, well, you might have sorry, not an overbearing, but you might have a tendency or, or a very ident a big identification with that animus side, and even almost that shadow side of the animus. In fact, what we could do is we could have two gradiented systems with the positive traits of the anima on that side, positive traits of the animus on that side, and then a further one with the negative traits of the anima and the negative traits of the animus, and you could be graduated on both. So, for example, there might be someone who has um, a tendency for that negative shadowy side of the animus, um, and it could be quite far over to that side, right near that kind of end zone of that of the full animus kind of thing. Um, but uh, Or you could have someone else who's kind of a little bit more in the middle, or you could have someone else who's on that sort of more positive side and we could also say that the default personality traits or the big five personality traits also could come in with it to this with regards to agreeableness or so, something like that as well um, so you've also got that link in there and obviously all these things make up um, personality obviously your personality traits on the Myers-Briggs uh, you know the d default personality traits or at least this is what I feel makes up personality the all the concepts in, in Jungian psychology um, and things like that and then it all all these things come together in a sort of very uncertain but very unique personality in terms of uncertain within regards to uh, a grey area because everyone is unique, everyone is a unique expression and so to be able to actually put down um, a person's personality to um, everything that's black or white, it, it can't be done. I don't, I don't think it can be done but certainly if you can use loads of different concepts together you can kind of get an idea on a certain level of oh that's kind of their unique expression of personality um, but even then you can't get fully to it you can't get fully in there you can never know yourself fully essentially and trust me I, I know that from doing so much introspection on myself I always get so close I always feel I'm so close to self-understanding in its completion and then I think no I just I just can't quite get there. It is, it's funny, it is really funny, but anyone who looks into themselves for such an extended time will realise that at some point. Um, anyway, so yeah, you've got this kind of gradiented system, and so everyone's different, everyone has this different playing of the anima animus, everyone has a different integration with them and stuff, and it isn't just necessarily clean cut or anything, obviously there's women out there, as I say, who have stronger animus, and then there's men out there who have a stronger anima and all the rest of it. Now it's important to say as well that we've got to be careful of how we actually understand the anima and the animus in terms of whether we should be integrating them or to, in terms of the, in, within the expression of our own personality. So it might be that you're more of a feminine man within your conscious personality and we've got to be careful not to necessarily change that in too much because that also could be a product of just your unique expression of personality and that's very natural. And so we can't necessarily try and make someone be masculine. But on the flip side of that, if let's say they are struggling with a little bit of psychological instability and clearly they do need to integrate a bit more of that masculine side, we need to obviously offer that as a as a um, kind of a service there or product there of saying 
this is possibly what you may need to do if you obviously are feeling a little bit of in, uh, psychological instability you may need to integrate this masculine side a bit more but that doesn't mean to say that, that that necessarily changes the conscious personality of someone too much and that would be um again i feel like it would be straying into that kind of element of, of being something that's a little bit wrong. I mean, clearly we do need some sort of integration with these within our unconscious, but at the end of the day, we don't want to change fully people's conscious personalities. Yes, we could argue, and, and it's definitely possibly more of the right um, idea, but we need to change people's perspectives on themselves and change people's perspectives people's perspectives on the open world uh, on the outside world external world and therefore feel more contented inside themselves from that as well from that new change in perception but actually changing someone's um conscious personality um and trying to for you know it all comes down to this forcing people whenever you're forcing people i feel that's the wrong thing to do it has to happen naturally and jungian psychology is all about this natural formation of this beautiful expression of um of someone um expressed from the the basis of the totality of self coming from that basis and and not forcing things or anything so yes it's fine to obviously in psychoanalysis wanting to change the perspective someone has on themselves and, and make them understand obviously where maybe issues lie and stuff but obviously we don't want to necessarily be changing people to uh, uh, this this big extent or anything because obviously it is naive to think you can change a person anyway and things are going to flow how they're going to flow. Um, but I think we, we do need to um, give uh, give all due respect to that as a that idea as well. Um, so also I wanted to touch on the shadow side, so I've kind of already done that. So obviously you've got the overbearingness, the opinionatedness of the animus, and then you've also got a little bit of that oversensitivity of the animus. So you can see those there anyway, and I've, I've touched on them quite a bit. Um, anima and... Uh, I've put anima and anima. Should be anima and animus. So anima and animus not defining the gender of a person. Again, I've touched on that quite a bit. So, um, you know, I don't want to give the opinion that obviously the anima or the animus defines a person. That's not simply what it is. It's simply a part of the personality. And it's a part that is um, very good to integrate. It's a part that's very efficient when integrated. And it fe makes you feel uh, more whole and more well-rounded and obviously get you closer to um, individuation and being a strong happy individual inside yourself with plenty of inherent character and good ego strength but ego strength in the positive idea of ego strength not the negative there's a negative idea of ego strength when we get into the far-fetched uh, more far-fetched uh, ego strength which would be delusions of grandeur ego inflation that could be the negative of it but there's a positive of ego ego strength as well and it's good to have a little bit of ego strength there so uh yeah uh i just wanted to touch on that and then anima slash anima yeah so anima slash animus i did it again there anima slash anima uh, animus image i'm i keep doing it i'm i'm creating freudian slips here it's crazy um yeah so the images the actual images so in dreams, Jung said that the animus, and this is what I've noticed in my own dreams actually whenever I've had dreams of my animus. In fact, I had one dream where there was a gr I was with a group of lads actually, and then my self archetype, who is, who's the magician, my, one of my self archetypes is the magician, and so uh, that came to me in the form of Dumbledore. And then suddenly these, this group of lads were tied together, and there was this opening in the sky, uh, and then light was coming down from the opening, which the light represents consciousness. And my self archetype, the magician, uh, the magician is also synonymous, or it can be synonymous with power. Um, for some reason, these these group of lads were tied up together, and the magician um, used his wand uh, and and put them up to that light. And what that was an expression of within the dream is actually gaining more conscious awareness of my animus because my animus for quite a while in myself uh, was actually repressed or in the unconscious, which is the actual reverse opposite of what it, well, I don't want to say should be because it's so 
uh, you know, there's all these different personalities, all these different gradients. There's not necessarily one specific way of how it definitely should be um, uh, or how someone should act or how someone should be. I think that it's just simply uh, we are who we are, essentially. I do take that standpoint. But, of course, I had that sort of repressed animus and I had a more conscious anima. And so my, my magician, my self-archetype was revealing that animus uh, within that conscious awareness. The light, as I say, representing the consciousness and the magician pulling pulling those animus uh, figures up to my consciousness. And within this dream, it was there was a big storm going on and everything. And on the ground where the magician was, it was all dark and it was it, it felt eerie and stuff. That could represent the fact that that scene was, was the unconscious. And so my, my magician was pulling it up again, as I say, to the, to the consciousness. Uh, and it was funny because after that, and even now I'm still going through it, um, I'm starting to gain more awareness of the animus specifically started with the shadow side of the animus which was odd uh, I don't know why necessarily I, I would gain more awareness of the shadow side first but anyway um, I started with that and then now slowly uh, over the past few months and I, I will announce that it's been very very slow that's another thing integration with these concepts can be very very slow indeed in terms of when you're interpreting dreams and stuff um, but slowly I'm getting more familiar with the reasoned external strength of the animus in which could be grounded within mature traits of the masculine the king and uh particularly the king and the hero archetype of a warrior i know obviously in the book that i forgot what the name it's down there actually the book i've not read it yet um but there's a book done on four traits uh, the traits of uh, four traits of the mature masculine and uh, I know in that book it's expressed as a warrior because obviously the full potential of the hero, the hero becomes the warrior essentially. But I always use the archetypes of the hero and the warrior as interchangeable rather than in the concept of that which would be the hero uh, would come maybe in later teenage years and then the warrior in you know maybe well it depends really it could be any age but we'll just say for this circumstance maybe early adulthood or maybe later 20s or something like that early later 20s um, and then that's the full expression of a warrior um and obviously that's kind of when you're leaving home or you know early 20s mid 20s you're leaving home you're setting up home uh, a home of your own and therefore you have to take on board that kind of warrior um, archetype and so that's why it's one of the traits of mature masculine because you need to step up and you need to be the, the the warrior not in the sense of obviously an actual warrior with a sword and going out there fighting but just obviously setting up your own home and going out there and maybe you start up your own business and that could be synonymous with this kind of warrior archetype that you've integrated or or you go out there and you you know you go into a job that maybe you're a bit unsure of but again that warrior archetype starting to get integrated and you're going going out there and you're doing that and then obviously you get promoted and stuff and then obviously you'll you'll note that um, people who are very very high up in organizations um, will have a very close association with the king and the warrior um, and you will be able to see it very very firmly those people the problem is that when you get to become a ceo or anything like that um, you can actually go on to the negative side of those archetypes so instead of being a fair and just uh, ruler or king and instead of being a, a fair and chival chivalrous warrior essentially you become the the parody of those which you could be the twisted king the evil king and obviously within an organization you can see that by the ceo becoming greedy and things like that and not respecting the welfare of the employees and all that sort of stuff it's very very easy to see um you can see it in films and stuff as well in fact archetypes and things like that are very very good if you want to learn about them, to look at certain films, um, films you can really, really prominently see uh, the archetypes because, in fact, they what happens is in a good film, the filmmakers will amplify the archetype, so they'll really show them in, in full force rather than just partially being able to see them in a smaller light within people in daily life. Although you can see them with a little bit of discernment you can start in a little bit of training you can start to see different archetypes come out in different people in daily life um so yeah that's the um so i don't even know what i was going on about then but yeah so the anima and animus images so yeah that was what i was talking about wasn't it so the animus can generally represented by a group of men and then that obviously leads back 
that kind of animus image leads back to the overbearingness of the anime, uh, animus. You can see that there um, with the fact that obviously being in a group, it could be thought of as a bit more overbearing. And so at the animus in dreams normally comes within a group. And the anima is every time I've seen it in dreams, trust, I have had tons of dreams on the anima, crazy amount of dreams. Every single time it is a woman. It's normally a different woman, although there has been dream series, which I've had. In fact, I had a dream series that was centered around prime evil. And it was a collective dream series, so you know I will do a separate video on dream interpretation. But you have personalized dream, you have personal unconscious dreams or collective unconscious dreams. And the personal unconscious dreams are generally themes that you can relate to your own life and just about personal development and things like that. But then the collective dreams are where you get more of the archetypal themes. And so this series of dreams that I had was a collective series of dreams in which I was following the anima as Abby Maitland in Primeval, and so. That was really interesting, actually, to see the anima actually come over about three dreams. It was a three or four dream uh, dreams in this series, and it was just the same image, that same image that was the anima, which is interesting. Now, Jung also said, I believe, in somewhere, I don't know exactly where, in one of his books, that essentially the anima, before it's integrated, will come to you as a fixed image, or you'll see it as a fixed image, and then once it's integrated, it will come at, in, come at you in different images. Now, my experience, and it's... It's a bit unclear for me because I don't really, I can I've only got myself to relate to here. But my experience is that in dreams it's come to me as different images, which would be correct because I do and I have had for since childhood um, more of an association with the anima. That's kind of how I've grown my psyche has grown to to become. I've got that more feminine side rather than the masculine side, so it would be correct that it comes to me in different forms, and therefore that's um, obviously meaning that I've integrated it, and obviously I've not integrated my animus, but. Um, I have also had a, uh, I had an animal image, um, a personalised animal image that came to me and I used to always, whenever I used to fantasise uh, in high school, because of well, even before high school as well, but well, no, probably early high school at minimum, um, I used to see this image and it used to be this woman and she would have blonde hair, she wouldn't have glasses, I can almost see her now but I can't see her fully, it's a bit distorted. Um, which would have, you know, a blonde hair, um, seemed to have a lovely smile over the rest of it. And that was kind of my personal anima image. But then, obviously, as I say, more recently, especially uh, over the last few years, um, it's obviously um, been different images. But then that means that I hadn't have integrated my anima before maybe the age of about 16, which could be true because at about 16 was when I stopped seeing that anima image in fantasy in terms of the personalised anima image. Um, so, but I have, and when I've looked into my psyche in terms of when I've really looked into uh, my childhood experiences and stuff, it seems very apparent that I actually integrated my anima or had maybe an over-identification with the anima, we should phrase it like that, way before 16. So it, it, it's odd for me there, but you can see a personalised image and then obviously you get over that personalised image uh, and then you see just like, it'll come to you in infinite amounts of images that could be various different images for uh, symbolising the anima or the animus. Um, now, really my on look onto the animus within dreams is very, very skewed and obscure compared to my understanding and affiliation with the anima in dreams. So I can't really touch upon too much with personalised images of the animus. I can say that I've had dreams that um, are, are very... Uh, there's been one dream, actually, of an older man who was following me through this... Um, building and I feel like the building for me represented unconsciousness and or the unconscious and so there was this man who was fairly he wasn't actually attacking me or anything like that but he was he was present he was there and it was kind of like this shadowy side to the, the animus I felt that that's what it was anyway so it really did feel like that you know he, he had a, he, although he's an older man he had this kind of a little bit of overbearingness and every time I would try and get out of this building out of the unconscious I, I, I would be stopped by this man it seemed like he would pop up in every place where there was a door and so it was a little bit overbearing there um, and uh, but and I've had plenty of other dreams with the animus, of course, like I just mentioned with that other wizard dream. But I can't, whenever I'm faced with it, 
I can't necessarily see it as well as my anima, and that obviously would denote, or it could denote, but obviously I don't have as much integration with my animus as I do my anima, and therefore I need to keep dreaming, keep interpreting, and all the rest of it to be able to, to gain more familiarity with that figure and be able to see it more clearly. But certainly I've seen it in dreams, I just can't really relate a proper, you know, re really proper uh, firm images to them essentially, or to the animus. And so I think that I'll leave it there for really the Animo and Animus. I am going to actually add, I recorded a while back, another section on the Anima and Animus. And so I'm going to add that to the end of this video as well. Uh, just sort of talking through a few other things that I really felt that I needed to cover. And I did it in that video instead of this video. Um, so yeah, there's going to be a few different things. I think I talk in that video about the goddess ideal and the idea of projecting your anima or your animus onto the opposite sex and then obviously I mean that can also um, within that there's actually the idea of the crush or even possibly you could say and actually um, in that book that I just wrote, James Hall in that book that I just read with James Hall he says um, essentially that and actually, I should have said that some of these traits here um, were identified to me. Well, actually, I know I did say at the start, didn't I, um, with the kind of the logic and stuff like that. But yeah, they were in that book as well, which is a very, very interesting book. Um, but yeah, so, um, oh, what was going to say now? One second, I have to think what I was going to say. Oh, yeah, so he said that essentially um, it was about, you know, it could even be um, looked at as falling in love as well, simply that anima projection. And it's very, very funny when you look into psychology or philosophy or anything like that um, and you really have experience of this, you, everything in terms of emotion or things like that doesn't have the same appeal or zest in one, in one regard. In, in another regard, it actually has more excitement and more zest. But in one regard, it doesn't have as much zest because you can simply put it down to a certain thing. So I could say, well, if I, let's say, have attraction towards a woman, we could put it down, yes, to obviously physical chemical reactions happening in, in my body. But in unison with that, I can put it down to obviously a projection of my idealized God image or goddess image of a woman, uh, the anima, but, but in, in this idealized form of a projection onto her. And then I think, well, really, I know that that woman isn't, you know, that amazing or whatever, and I'm just essentially um, projecting that out or having that crush for no necessary or logical reason. And then you think, well, no, it's not as it's not quite as exciting, you know, as it would be if you didn't know it. You see, if you didn't know that was what was happening, you'd be like, oh yeah, this is wonderful. This is all, and that's why we say ignorance is bliss, really. And when you when you become less ignorant to these things, it's like, oh yeah. You know, you just you're not as bothered, or maybe even you, with some in some circumstances, in terms of the ignorance is bliss saying, um, it can mean that you're a little bit scared or whatever. But obviously, that doesn't necessarily apply to this circumstance. So yeah, I talk a little bit about about that and a, a few other things that I wanted to add on. Obviously, it will have been a very long video by the time we are done talking about the anima and animus, but. It deserves it. It deserves way more talking about it than this. But um, this is just obviously what I'm what I'm going to be touching on now. Um, also, we have got an idea, just very very briefly before I finish this, of kind of the over identification with one or the other, and the kind of because obviously the anima and the animus are archetypes in, in kind of a way, and so. Um, you can get a little bit of archetypal reductionism in terms of speaking with them in just kind of the terms of um, what the anima is and what the animus is and, and you can actually start to associate with one quite heavily and stuff like that and then that would be you'd be kind of consciously overriding the process in a negative way and then you would gain over familiarity with one consciously and uh, especially as I say if you're looking into yourself psychologically I mean this may happen more unconsciously as well there's a chance it could happen but maybe not to the same degree as if you were um, looking into yourself psychologically because if you were prone to archetypal reductionism um, then obviously you could really over identify with one of them and, and then that leads you away from uh, individuation and as I've talked about in another video actually one that you may have not seen yet I don't know what the order of these videos are going to come out as, as I've mentioned in another video but um, essentially uh, with the archetypes video I was kind of over exaggerating the archetypes uh, and and that could it could be um, identified to some that I was almost 
within the realm of archetypal reductionism, but simply what I was talking about there with the archetypes is I was over-exaggerating the archetypes or over-exaggerating what they mean um, to be able to obviously share them because it, uh, my favourite philosopher, Alan Watts, actually, he says that um, within philosophy, and you could also in some, what, some regard apply this to the concepts in psychology as well, within philosophy, um, it's always good to exaggerate the concepts that you're talking about because if you exaggerate them, it actually makes people click, it makes them click more. Whereas if you don't exaggerate with them, people might not know what they are first off, but if you exaggerate a lot, then what you can do, people know what the concepts are, and then you can ground them in a little bit more reality, rather than trying to slowly ease your way in, and yeah, it might you might be not facing any sort of archetypal reductionism or anything like that, but you've got people might not understand the concepts intellectually and obviously you both need an intellectual viewpoint on this but also you need an experiential viewpoint and actually looking in the psyche for yourself and then obviously uh, discerning the archetypes in relation to your personal situation or discerning you know the animal animus or whatever it may be um but yeah i think it's important that people have uh you know definitely an, an intellectual viewpoint on them but also understand that that intellectual viewpoint isn't the be all and end all and that it's crucial it is crucial that you obviously look inside yourself and gain your own experience on this stuff and then relate it to your personal situation within the context of individuation within the context of your own waking real life and not just live in that element of fantasy not just live in that realm of dreaming and stuff it's very very easy and trust me on this because i've done it very very easy to get caught up in that fantasy element of the unconscious and just loving the archetypes and loving the all the concepts and stuff and and all the things that are popping up in your dreams and not really applying it to real life you've got to apply it to real life and you've got to make sure that um you're not uh, being reductionistic in any way in terms of putting things down to one specific thing it's it's still quite ambiguous really it's gradiented it's 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 a little bit gray it's not necessarily that one person is a certain archetype or one person is this or even one person is um, a collection of archetypes it's even more finite than that it's it goes on a such a finite level that i don't even really anyone can fully understand it um but you know that's what it is essentially so i'll leave it there guys and uh, you will see me just in a in a second uh, when i come back to talk a little bit more on these concepts so I was just reviewing the footage of the Anima Animus video and there was actually a fair bit that I actually wanted to add on to the end. Now I had talked about doing a video on attraction and there's elements obviously of the Anima and Animus for playing between the male and female um, within an attraction video or that would come into it slightly anyway. Those kind of overarching shared experiences uh, and, and themes uh, and also obviously on a personal level of attraction. So I thought instead of doing that video uh, or I might do a sort of subtler version of that video in future but I'll actually sort of talk a little bit more about a few different ideas of the Animo and Animus and also how it can possibly relate to um, obviously viewing the opposite sex and things like that and possibly a little bit of attraction comes into it um, and yeah I thought I'd just tag that on the end and I thought that the video for some reason I know it was a 30 minute video or whatever it was but I thought it just needed a few more different elements um, to be explained with regards to the anima and the animus or the animus and the anima uh, whichever way around you want to particularly say it I normally weirdly I, well it's not that weird because actually I have an over integration with my animus uh, my anima in my conscious awareness anyway so um necessarily it wouldn't be that weird uh but i actually always say or most of the time i say anima animus rather than animus anima um i don't know whether for someone uh, a person let's say who has more of an integration with their animus whether they'd say it the opposite way around but i thought it'd be interesting from an unconscious point of view which way around people actually say that and then you could get some sort of it's, it's almost like a freudian slip in which uh, you start to know which one you more associate with by the unconscious um a production of which way around you're saying but as well as at the end of the day that's kind of possibly a little bit um of a crude way of, of thinking about it but you never know i mean 
you could possibly just pull out something from the unconscious just in that even that very very small thing um but anyway so with that being said we are going to get on with this and we're going to talk through a few of uh, the other elements so i was kind of i have always um in this kind of pursuit of awareness of my animo and awareness of my animus as well and more so for me it's been awareness of my animus rather than my anima but i've always um more recently, uh, I don't know, over the last six months or so, during that period, I've always kind of been able to see the anima or the animus in a very clear-cut way. And it's weird how the anima kind of comes about. And I'll tell you the anima in relation to my animus. So I often imagine it as my anim animus is very, especially the shadowy side to my animus, is very... Um, kind of overbearing and powerful and almost lustful as well. There's a lot of kind of um, lustful and sexual feelings within that or encapsulated certainly within that kind of um, link between the animus and, and the shadow as well or in Freudian terms, the kind of the id, um, you know, those lustful desires that come out and all the rest of it. Um, and so I've kind of had conversations in my mind between my animal and my animus and my I, just sort of acting them out essentially in sort of uh, daydreaming or something like that um, or fantasizing in which my animus always comes out, uh, you know, this overbearing, confident, kind of intellectual guy who's quite shadowy as well and overbearing at the same time who I've talked about in other videos who in my uh, on my other channel, he kind of a personal manifestation, a personal image of uh, my the shadow side of my animus or that kind of archetype um, comes out as obviously my character bads. And so I essentially see him and then there's this other woman who I've not named, it is definitely my anima, and she always comes to me in a different form, which is what Jung said, uh, in terms of the anima, normally you'll see them in dreams or active imagination, as a single person, a single woman, and you know most of the time they'll come to you in, a kind of, or pretty much all the time, in a different kind of um, physical manifestation, about a physical image of that. Um, and so there's always, it's never an actual physical, there's never one physical being that a personalised representation of the anima that I see, which is weird because I do have a physical personalised representation of the shadow side of the animus, which is bad. But again, that's me just obviously projecting that personalised image onto it. So therefore, I've just become a so like really, really closely associated to it in that way. But I very much know that behind that uh, personalised image, behind what, let's say, bad is as the shadow or the shadow side of my animus as well, or the shadow as a whole, but also inclusive of the shadow side of my animus, um, I always know that it's actually not him it, the shadow and what it means is far beyond him and far worse than him but it's kind of a it's a bridge um that personalized image is a bridge to integration with the, the real dark element of the shadow it's almost as if um bads is the guard or the guardian at the gate so uh, obviously i'm here and then you've got like this gate and then over the other side of the gate is the real real rabid shadow uh the real real kind of um craziness of the id uh, as freud would say um and and then bads is there and bads is become uh, a, a kind of personalized archetypal image um of holistic integration so that then i can I can commune with a real element of the shadow. Um, but so, but I don't have that for the anima. However, getting back to the point, I have this um, plane of energy and my anima always seems to, in these uh, ideas, and even when I'm not doing this, when I'm not daydreaming or in active imagination or anything like that, but even just in my daily life, I actually, the words that I use are very reminiscent of my anima. And I have a little joke with myself, of course, this isn't really grounded in anything whole or full or um, meaning, like incredibly, incredibly meaningful, although there is some small element of meaning to it in which my anima, whenever, let's say, bads comes into my awareness or that kind of seductive side of my animus, that possibly we could call it that slightly more shadowy side of the animus, or, or slowly bleeding back into the shadow side. Obviously, it's a very shallow shadow side. It's not really in the depths of the unconscious. It's not terrible or anything like that. But that sh sort of shallow side, 
there's always this playing and the anima, my anima, coming back to this seductive anima. Um, it, well, first off, actually, it's always, I, she always seems to say seriously. Oh, seriously, all that sort of stuff. Or seriously, you know, like, like that. In a way to kind of um, make the animus a little bit shaken, you know, sort of like um, a, a teasing element to the animus. So uh, it's always in conscious awareness. And I've, I've done this randomly, I'd say seriously and stuff like that when I'm having um daydreams or um fantasies in which there's this plane i sometimes just can't help but say seriously like that as if i'm communicating with my animus it, 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 like i've got my anima and conscious awareness and then my animus is um obviously in, inside my mind inside the unconscious at that time and i'm actually communicating like that with it so the communicating consciously as the anima uh, against the the unconscious of the animus in that circumstance um and it, it is, it's really, and then other times I've had where um, the animus, I have got that in my full conscious awareness and then I'm actually um, playing it from the other side and then obviously sort of almost communing with the unconscious anima. It's, it's really, really, really hard to explain, but it's so interesting. And there's this idea in the anima, or inside my anima, of sort of like, she wants the animus, she wants the animus to come and get her, but there's this kind of feeling within her as, oh, you're just kind of a brutish guy who's hell-bent on lust and all the rest of it. It's almost exactly typical of that um, early relationship between the man and the woman, where the man is possibly a bit more, you know, overbearing uh, and coming in and obviously wants um, both, well, I'd say more sexual experience than emotional experience with the woman, but certainly, you know, it, encap it encapsulates both in some regard. Um, but then the woman's kind of teasing, the woman's, there's almost a little bit of an el element of seduction there, but it's not quite seduction yet. It's more just a little bit of, of teasing, but then it can turn into more seduction um, when obviously she's after she's created, let's say, a little bit of a void, something like that, which Alan Watts actually points out brilliantly. Um, Obviously, there's this kind of mysterious element between the man and the woman. And also, when, let's say, uh, this is what Alan Watts says, but absolutely brilliant, this. When, um, obviously, a man is pursuing a woman, a woman wants a man to feel um, as if, the, you know, her in herself is a highly prized object, to use his words exactly. And so she makes a little bit of a void. She steps back a little bit. And possibly she she teases him subtly in conversation and things like that, just to lead him on a bit, if obviously she does um, apparently like him, let's say. Um, but she lets the man do the work. And this is to test the man. This is to get the hero archetype really activated within the man. See if see if his hero archetype, see if he is a mature masculine. There's actually uh, the, four trait, the four archetypes of the mature masculine. I think magician, warrior, king, and... Oh, I always forget the last one. It's not wise old man, is it? Magician, warrior, king, lover. That's it, obviously, lover. Um, so, and the lover doesn't just mean sexual lover, it means emotional lover, it means a, a holistic lover. Um, also, within the realm of, let's say, a family, a lover of the family being able to uh, love in a holistic way of uh, the, the children that he's produced, all the rest of it. So, it's kind of this kind of void that's created, this kind of subtle teasing. Obviously, the woman does want the man, but Obviously, the man wants to, uh, uh, it's to kind of challenge the man, challenge that hero within the man, challenge that mature masculine in the man. And we'll get to later on, actually, um, the idea of possibly the goddess ideal coming into that and possibly the man actually, if, let's say, uh, he's not fully integrated with his hero archetype, if he's, if he's not really experienced that element so much, if he's not really, you know, quite strong in that regard, uh, that that goddess ideal and also that kind of level of teasing and kind of that void that the woman creates will actually put him off and then he'll, he'll go away. But there's also, um, I mean, is it fair to say sexuality comes into this? 
possibly, but uh, I would say maybe um, a misrepresent, a, a misunderstanding of sexual sexuality may come into this, um, and that's something I've battled with myself. You know, I'll openly admit that it's hard for me. It's you know, it's been hard for me to uh, have these battles with sexuality and stuff. But um, essentially, there is. Uh, that could possibly come into it as well and 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 because you've got a, a skewed outlook of on your own sexuality you kind of don't know where you fit in this kind of dance between not only the male and the female but also a male and a male or let's say someone else a female and a female so there's a little bit of wavering there not understanding but then once you are even more holistic once you're actually let's say that's in the circumstance of just not being psychologically understanding of, of different concepts and of mythology and things like that but once you get more of a holistic understanding you can actually understand where you fit in uh, even if you are of a different situa sexuality than uh, heterosexual and then you can obviously understand that and gain uh, a level of understanding in what where you fit in mythologically within those terms or or psychologically within those terms to be able to develop wholeness as well and now i wanted to touch upon very briefly about childhood and physiological factors um of their manifestation so obviously i've touched upon the fact that um within childhood certain things might happen and then you'll be more uh, identified you might get more identification with the mother or more identification with the father whichever one and therefore respectively you're going to get more of a um integration with your anima or more of an integration with your anima so uh, and, and that really depends on things that happen in childhood and then obviously you may get you may have complexes form in childhood if if terrible things have happened to you, traumatic experiences, uh, you may get, rep well, you will get repression around that if you've got a complex, but you know, all these things like that happen in childhood, but also I wanted to discuss the physiological factors, because it's something that I didn't really talk about last time, now I, I am not really um, well clued up on this, it's simply an interest or an understanding of mine but possibly to actually get to the anima and the animus um there must be some level of a physiological factor a more scientific basis to this and i think personally just on a, a personal kind of very brief look that it's possible that testosterone comes into this that essentially um along with the mental effects of it there's got to be you see there's got to be a cause to why not not just in childhood that you get more identification with a father more identification with the mother why do you get more identification with a father why do you get more identification with a mother there must be a physiological cause to that more more grounded in the biology or science there must be something like that so i think it actually lends itself to testosterone possibly um certainly in the man i would say that i don't really know about the woman i don't know whether i i think i mean i'm not a scientist in this way i'm not a biologist i think that women do produce a certain amount of testosterone obviously not that that much of as a man but possibly because that's a link between the two sexes it could be to do with on a physiological level testosterone but i don't want to go into that too much in terms of yes I know it's that because I don't I'm just simply that seems like po it's a possible link and so if I look into biology in the future which no doubt I probably will at some point um, and then I can obviously get a better understanding and then maybe I can say oh you know what yeah um, from other research that people have done that I've read from my own opinion from looking at different things I actually am pretty certain that it is that but yeah there will be some level of physiological uh, there will be a physiological factor that co that kind of uh, comes about with regards to the anima and animus, um, and it probably mo it most probably precedes them as well. Um, I, I doubt it would actually come after. I think it would be a cause of the integration between the animus and the anima, or, or the the identification with a father or a mother, let's say, uh, not necessarily the integration of the two within individuation, but certainly um, the path in which you take to conscious awareness of either one or the other. Anyway, so uh, that's the physical, the childhood and physiological factors. They massively affect it, no doubt they massively affect it. Um, with, as I say, which you identify with uh, consciously and which is the unconscious one.
Um, the goddess ideal, now this is interesting, this is something I've had much personal experience with, so it's something I can talk about quite quite uh, easily here. So, the goddess ideal, what happens is, essentially, uh, you. I mean, I was thinking of also calling this an ego ideal, I mean, an ego ideal is too personal really it's not it's not quite it doesn't isn't quite fitting obviously i was thinking that in freudian terms of an ego ideal it, it doesn't quite fit so i'm gonna actually go with goddess ideal actually and other people have called it this as well and so you and, and also a god ideal not just a goddess ideal for a woman a god ideal um although it does seem and this could go along with the kind of internal intelligence that i was talking about the anima it does seem that the anima doesn't necessarily, but again, I'm not in the mind of a woman completely, so I can't say this for certain, but it does seem that it's more, it possibly is more of a man that projects the goddess ideal and puts more weight to that than the woman when obviously she put, she projects a god ideal. It seems, I don't know why, but I just feel as if it's less weight to the woman than the man. Now, obviously, that might be to do with the fact that I am a man, and so when I project that ideal, it's very, very strong, and then I just don't think that a woman would experience it in that same strength, because I, I, it's so overwhelming sometimes. So it might be that, but I don't think it is, because I'm, I'm, I'm not... Well, yeah, I mean, sometimes I am that naive, but... Um, yeah, I, I just I feel like with the internal t intelligence of the anima, uh, especially someone, let's say, who uh, has a um, gravitation towards being intuitive, being very intuitive. Um, so someone like myself, let's say an INFJ, uh, who but who's a woman, I would see. I would say actually that maybe in some circumstances she can actually have the intelligence to understand the God ideal and then get over it. But that doesn't. Uh, account for even first um, coming across it because everyone has first times of coming across things and therefore you wouldn't be able to be uh, wholly intuitive in such a way on your first time you'd still get absorbed by it like I did so um, yeah so we've got basically the goddess ideal the god ideal is the projection uh, psychological projection of this ideal onto the other person this perfect ideal it, it almost somewhat relates to the social persona in a way but instead of it being your ideal in terms of how you should come across it's kind of you're projecting that outwards on someone else you say you in a slightly different way of course um you're kind of projecting this brilliant beautiful amazing person you know when you first have a crush this is the best way to explain it you first have a crush and you see see this person and weirdly enough time seems to stand still for just a minute and you're looking at them the hair's just you know fluttering in the wind and they're just absolutely perfect absolutely there's nothing that could possibly uh be wrong with them at all you just think and obviously that isn't the case because they're human um and and so you, you project this out and it's this goddess ideal and that is uh, I'll put it here, it's a help and a hindrance in a way. It's a help because when you project that unconsciously, what's going on is there's a there's a very uh, primal thing that's happening there. Because you, let's say as the man who are projecting that goddess ideal out onto the woman, you unconsciously um, are more associated with the father, or more associated with the hero, because you've projected that goddess out, so you, you, you become firm in that, and then obviously if you actually have the gumption, and you, you go for that, and then you are able to actually get over that goddess ideal, um, then obviously in the long term, um, you'll be able to integrate with the anima, you know, sort of talk, talking long term time scale, um, but also aside from that, uh, you'll be able to feel more grounded within your own role within, let's say, uh, this this hero role of the man, or this uh, also this kind of um, kingly role of the man as well. Um, but just that kind of your role as the man, essentially. And this doesn't mean to say that um, you know the man has to be perfect and heroic and all the rest of it, because obviously this comes back to more. Um, 
uniqueness as well so we've got the we've got the personality behind this so yes there can be an integration of the hero archetype in the man there can be um uh, obviously that integration of the king and being a man but it doesn't mean to say that the man always has to be incredibly firm and uh, not necessarily backing down and all the rest of it that would essentially be an over exaggeration of it and obviously there are men like that but we've also got to assess other sides of the personality and it's actually some men can actually have uh you know integration with a hero archetype integration with let's say the ruler or the king but actually be very emotional uh very considerate um and and yeah and really actually lovely people again that lends itself to a bit more of integration with the anima um but i don't want to necessarily make people think that that is the sole function of the man that is the sole way that the man should behave in uh archetypal terms or or, or personal even um yes there is an element of that to it but we also have to actually understand our own conscious personalities and the integration of that within our own conscious personalities and for some people as i say it'll come out more kind of yes i am that kind of big strong macho, macho man but you've got to recognize that also for, for you personally it might come out in a in a more subtle way so you might have as i say this integration but it'll come out subtly and uh, also as you slowly gain integration with the anima you'll you'll realize even more the wholeness and in uh, and and this union as well that then really turns you into a um a, a solid character essentially and, and as i talked about earlier on in the other video um essentially you may have a man who's very macho and all the rest of it and he may let's say have integrated with his anima um and just because you integrate with the anima doesn't necessarily distort your personality or anything it, it, they may still be this kind of macho uh, strong man but you will see in them however subtly it may be you will see in them um some level of um you know just that understanding that subtleness that kindness that all these different things so many of these different things that are, you can't even name because there's so many different characteristics of it there's so many different uh ways to describe the anima in one regard really um but you will see that in him you will see that you'll see that kind of that what can only really be described uh, as as the anima essentially and within the anima as i say it encapsulates all these different things so many different things um so yeah you have the goddess ideal and it can be helping or hindering so it can be hindering in the idea of um as i just met as i mentioned not long ago uh the man can actually get like absorbed well there's, there's actually a few ways it can be hindering the man gets absorbed by that but actually enters into the, rela the relationship with the woman and then what you get is you get someone who's completely infatuated and is almost um a little bit of an oedipal ch ch child so there's actually a um I'll, I'll do it in another video. I'll draw it on the board in another video. But um, there's a positive shadow pole of the Oedipal child, which comes before integration with the hero, and that is a that is a dreamer basically. So by some uh, you know by a life experience, the the man ends up getting into a relationship with a woman, but he's not really reached that level of warrior or hero yet essentially um and so he's still a little bit attached to this kind of positive shadow pole of the oedipal child which is the dreamer and within the dreamer you kind of can subtly see the goddess the, the goddess ideal and so you'll get a man who's in a relationship with a woman who may may or may not have integrated his hero i mean you can integrate your hero archetype and still be a bit of a dreamer like that you know it's, as i say it's it's very graduated this system it's not that it's it's not black or white this i mean it is in a way because you say well the hero and the child archetypes they're in direct opposite opposite to each other the child is the complete opposite of the hero but between them you always have this gradient as well so it's not it's not ever it can be black the weird thing is it can be thought of as black and white or a, a rainbow of colors that's how weird it is really in Jungian psychology with a lot of things but essentially uh you know obviously he's in this relationship and he's got this little dreamer element and he's projecting this goddess ideal on a still and um you better just not hope that you better hope that that woman's not going to fall from grace 
uh, in the eyes of that man. Otherwise, you know, it's. It, I think that it would be a bit psychologically. There would be a bit, a bit, a bit, there would be a bit of psychological instability there. But obviously, as we all know, uh, if you're projecting an unreal ideal, oh, I've said that before as well. I love that unreal ideal. Um, if you're projecting an unreal ideal, which is a goddess ideal, I mean, a goddess ideal is an unreal ideal. It's a, it's too far, it's too high of a standard to project onto someone. So if you're projecting an unreal ideal onto someone like that, uh, then it's going to fall at some point anyway. So, yeah, you've got to get over this goddess ideal, really. That's uh, very, very key. It took me a very long time. It took me probably longer than most to get over that goddess ideal. Uh, but it's, inter it's a very interesting idea anyway, that... Um, and this is interesting as well. Affirmation of one another, taking comfort in one another. So obviously when we talk about Jungian psychology in terms of individuation, in terms of the wholeness of self or the, the wholeness of the totality of self or, or the totality of self, um, we always talk about obviously the integration primarily of the anima and the animus. Obviously, you have the integration of shadow and social persona and all the rest of it. But a big thing to Jungian psychology and individuation is the uh, integration of both of these things, and it creates the wholeness. Well, this is exactly right. We see this in, in real life, even not, not internally psychologically, uh, necessarily in this example that I'm going to give, but in real life, we each take comfort in a relationship the uh, strengths of the anima, essentially, um, make up for, let's say, the weaknesses of the animus and vice versa. And so we tend to, um, I mean, it, it comes within love, it comes within the feeling of love. We take comfort in one another's company, we take comfort in one another's strengths, we take comfort within, let's say, the woman or the man, we take comfort in the opposite. And so they kind of affirm one another in that way. And, and that's interesting. And obviously the goal of individuation is to actually get this affirmation in, internally, psychologically, so that then you, you don't necessarily wholly depend on that externally as an, you know, obviously you're, project, you're psychologically projecting your anima out onto uh, the woman. You actually take ownership of that internally, like I mentioned again, right at the start of the other video, uh, well, this video, but, you know, I've split it into two, um, and so you're not doing that anymore. You're not actually projecting that externally. It's not something that you're trying to reach externally. It's something that you've realised internally. And so you have that level of... Com well, I really shouldn't say this because I don't really know whether I'm integrated with my anima or my, my animus or anything. There's no logical... There's no um, mathematical way of uh, measuring it or scientific way of measuring it, really. You're just basing it on what you, what you think you can see in your psyche and anything but anyway but uh, and that's basically it but there's this comfort inside your mind rather than you know ex rather than it being external it's, it's within there it's it's solid you're a solid whole mana personality individuated human um and so that doesn't mean to say that uh, you're this lovely, comforted person inside your mind and nothing externally affects you, that would essentially be a robot. But, you know, you have, uh, you're individuating, you're, you're an individual in your own right, you're, uh, you're comfort, comforted inside yourself by your psychological wholeness. And so whatever the world decides to throw at you, um, it, you know, it's not like a, it, it may, you may go through hard times, it may be, there may be bad times and stuff, but, Deep within, you feel a sense of psychological wholeness, psychological stability. And, uh, I mean, I always have this, uh, I've always had this idea of if you get to a really good level of psychological health, that actually uh, physical uh, illnesses don't affect you as much. Now, I know that in uh, the New Thought movement and stuff like that, or religious science and things, they say, um, essentially, uh, you can get over any illness with your mind. I don't really go to that extent, but I do go to the extent of if you do have psychological wholeness to a really, really good extent, um, certain things that come your way, whether it's uh, to do with finances or, you know, anything in your life like that, or even physical illness or anything like that, you do feel a little bit more whole and comforting in yourself. And, and you, it's weird to, it is weird to say that you don't feel the pain as much, but 
in a way, I, I suppose that's possibly what it could be as well. I mean, obviously not in every circumstance. I mean, if you've got a terrible illness, you, it, that's just how it is. But in certain subtle little things, you have... You know what it is? It's not that you don't feel the pain as much. I think that you have more resilience, psychologically speaking. And that resilience up in your mind helps regulate and control your body. Because obviously the mind and body are connected. Uh, well, they're connected physically, obviously. But also they're connected, um, you know, they're just, they're just two connected elements, really, in aspects. So if your mind is working well, it makes sense that, obviously, if something isn't particularly working well in your body, your mind can kind of have a little bit of... Uh, the ship's direction of steering you as the ship in, in the right direction and, and keeping you afloat a little bit more easily. If, let's say, you have a tendency to be ooh, a bit wavering, a bit, psychological, uh, a bit of psychological instability, then it makes sense that if something comes along physically to, to actually... Um, well, kind of pervade you or whatever, then obviously that's going to be harder to get through, essentially. But anyway, that's that. So I just wanted to talk about that. And then also a very lovely concept in Jungian... Um, uh, in, well, I don't even know what I was going to say. In Jungian psychology, that's what... I was almost trying to say psychoanalysis, but anyway, Jungian psychology or analytical psychology, as I've talked about before. So this is a really lovely concept in Jungian psychology. I really do love this concept. And it's the female slash male in, in spiritrice. And that essentially means um, Jung talked about how uh, a man would need a woman to essentially who's there backing him up, who's there kind of helping him in his career, in his life, you know, not necessarily um, in a uh, physical way or actually helping him with his jobs. Uh, although that could possibly come into it, but more in you know a, a support psychologically there who who 's there solid by him um, and and supports him and cares for him and all the rest of it and there is a little bit of this idea of nurturing com coming into it as well, not necessarily nurturing like the mother to the son uh, but a certain type of nurturing as well between the man and the woman within the relationship or you know the wo in this case the female in spiritually the woman to the man um, and that 's a really really lovely concept, and I think that uh, it just goes towards actually getting that person to uh, their maximum potential and, and to really flourish in essentially in their career, in terms of their psychological health, in, in everything really. So I think that's a really nice idea. Now I don't know whether we touched on the opposite of that, would be, which would be the male in spiritualities. Obviously it was what, uh, early 1900s when he was talking about this stuff, but I don't know, maybe 1920s or something. So... I don't know whether we would have actually gone down the route of saying a male in spiritualities to actually support the female because obviously women's rights and all that aren't weren't then. I don't think they weren't as what they are now, uh, which obviously was, was terrible. But I think actually that updating this, we should do it for, for both. I think that, that wor it works both ways. And um, although I've not necessarily experienced this in a relationship... I have experienced this with friends and, you know, female friends and supporting them in a certain way and things like that and, and letting them know that I am grateful for um, both their friendship, for uh, what they're doing, you know, for their, the jobs that they have, for their career prospects, all this sort of All this stuff goes along with this. Although there is... Uh, and then, obviously, I was going to say, although there is a psychological aspect to it, but actually it's kind of these things that create the, the generative or the positive psychological aspect to it within that individual. So, um, yeah, I think that that's, that's very much the case as well. So, And we see it more these days with um, a lot of women going into business, a lot of women going into, uh, I mean, they have done for many, many years now, but, you know, it's, it's increasing more and more, and rightly so, of course. And we've got women going into business, in, into high, I'm not talking just business, just, you know, low-level business, but high uh, and business, I mean, the CEO of YouTube is uh, Susan, isn't she? So she's a woman. Um, I'm trying to think of other other corporations that have got women CEOs, but, but you know, it, it's still not as equal as maybe it should be. Um, but there are, you know, it's growing, it's growing, and there's, there is a lot of women in higher-up positions now. And so let's say that, and also, actually, coming back to things like, um, I don't know, 
men staying around the house and looking after the babies and stuff like that. You see, then the man takes on a little bit more of that feminine role in a certain aspect, you could argue that. Um, obviously, the man doesn't become a woman, but just takes on the traditional duties that, that were once the woman's duties, or could be classed as the woman's duties, although it's a kind of misogynistic viewpoint to say so. I'm just saying how it would have been categorised back years ago. Um, but yeah, essentially, the man maybe is more, more around the house. So therefore, obviously, the man in that situation, let's say you've got um, a woman in the relationship who is high powered, who's doing brilliant things, who's going off there and running a business that's worth hundreds of millions of pounds or something, or even just, uh, you know, a few thousand pounds or whatever it may be. It doesn't really matter. I'm just exaggerating with the example in saying this really high powered person who's running this massive business. But you say a woman does that and then the man stays at home to look after the kids and all the rest of it. And maybe he has like a little part-time job or something. I don't know. It's just an example. Um, but then obviously we get the idea that the man is should be encouraging towards a woman. And then that will obviously uh, go towards supporting the woman. Uh, and also obviously hopefully giving her a little bit of, of grounding and strength and stability. But ultimately again this is... This idea is an external validation of success or an external validation of stability. So we always have to be striving for internal stability. But if you have the internal stability and you are fortunate, fortunate enough to have um, this kind of level of the Stoics would call, as I've talked about before, preferred indifferent uh, or preferred indifference, um, if, you, if you're lucky enough to have that external preferred indifferent uh, within that relationship and you've got that strong psychological stability, then, you know, you, you're really, that's really good. That's a really, really positive relationship to be in. And for the most part, for a lot of people, it can work like that. And that's really, really brilliant. Unfortunately, within psychology, when you're looking into psychology, uh, you look at all the negative things that can happen, uh, much like if you are looking into uh, medicine or biology or anything like that, you look at, at the bad things can happen because when you study um, how organs of the body don't work, you know how they do work and you know how to repair them by kind of default as well. Or you certainly know how you certainly be able to know how to repair them. So when you look into psychology, you generally look at the uh, slightly... Um, lesser commonalities so then you know um, how to be able to uh, teach people about psychological health and give them an understanding of their psychological health more um, but for the most part a lot of these things happen quite regularly and quite common um, and quite common within relationships and within psychological health which is brilliant and that's how essentially it should be so I think we're going to kind of uh, close off here there was something else I was going to say but I've actually, there was something else I was going to um, talk about. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure anyway. I'll probably do it in another video. If it, I think it was something to do with, um, obviously I talked about kind of the gradient element and the childhood and physiological factors uh, and obviously the identification with the father or the mother. I think it was something to do with the identification with the father and the mother, but it's not crucial. It isn't crucial. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll do that another uh, later date. So, anyway... Uh, I'll leave it there, guys. Thank you very much for watching this very long video now. It's probably almost an hour and a half. And, uh, yeah, I will see you in the next one. So, see you very soon, guys.